Good morning. So let's do a quick wake up call. Who of you here uses Wi Fi? Okay, great. Everybody's awake? Well, almost everybody. Um, so, Wi Fi, I mean, if you're building anything using Wi Fi, you know that it's this opaque thing where you just, it's one of the things where you have a chip handling everything and abstracting all the complexities away from you. So, on the one hand, that's kind of cool because you don't have to deal with all the complexities. On the other hand, for us as, as hackers, it's not so cool because we don't know all the complexities and we don't know how it's working. So that's why we have Daniel here, who knows all the insides and outsides of Wi-Fi and the Wi-Fi chips, and uh, is going to tell us more about this now. Have fun. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks for showing up, everybody. So uh, I will talk about how uh, does a Wi-Fi chip work internally. And um, as the introduction said already, so why, why is this interesting? Um, for most of us, we just have a notebook which maybe has a Wi-Fi chip already integrated. And uh, usually we just know that somehow signals go in. And on the other hand, uh, on the other side, uh, internet comes out if we are lucky. And, uh, but still, like, what, what is in between? What is this, this, uh, this uh, black box of a Wi-Fi chip? What is happening in there? And um, yeah, so this is what I want to talk about today. Um, before g uh, going deeper into this topic, I just want to quickly talk about the history of Wi-Fi and how does this even uh, come into existence. And it all started with uh, AlohaNet, which uh, was introduced by the University of Hawaii. And um, they had uh, the problem back in the 70s, so 1970, they um, had a mainframe uh, on, on the sort of main island, which um, they had different terminals on like smaller islands around it, and they wanted to have all the terminals connect to this one mainframe. And um, they thought, okay, let's, let's uh, use um, wireless technologies for this. And so they decided to have like one frequency to send data from the mainframe to all the um, terminals and another frequency to send the data back from the terminals to the, to the mainframe. So this sounds uh, well and good uh, on, on first glance, but it turns out that you have a problem when two terminals want to send at the same time. And uh, this was the first time they encountered basically collisions and uh, they need to solve, needed to solve this somehow. And um, so th this was basically the, the first time they, they, they encountered this problem. And um, so um, in, in the first stage, they, they tried to solve it just by thinking maybe I don't need really to have a 100% reliant way of sending data to the mainframe and back. Maybe it's good enough to just say um, I, I need some kind of acknowledgement uh, that eventually it gets through. But maybe I don't need to send it uh, um, when I want to send the data. If it's OK, if it doesn't get acknowledged immediately, I just resend it over and over again till, till eventually it it will arrive and I get an acknowledgement back and then I know, okay, it, it has arrived, I can um, send the next data. And so basically they came up uh, with this uh, concept of acknowledgements and uh, this way they could solve, at least in a rough way, this, this issue with two people sending at the same time. And later on they also introduced like time slots and uh, more fancy um, channel access methods, but in the first stage they, they came up with this acknowledgement um, method. So um, here I just uh, tried to summarize like which uh, types of Wi-Fi standards there are. So they all start with uh, 802.11 and they are defined by the IEEE. The IEEE is a uh, uh, sort of uh, association of professionals who um, define these standards. And um, as you can see, it's uh, pretty old already. Uh, like the first one here I mentioned is 1999, but there are even older ones. And um, and then, so there is like, um, this is this, uh, from the nomenclature, they always have this 802.11, and then there is like this letter at the end. And uh, at some point they, they uh, uh, decided to have one letter is not enough, so we need two. And then, um, and then uh, at the later point in time, they even said, okay, let's screw all of these. Let's just uh, like uh, call it a generation name so that we can just increase the number. And then it's easier for, for people to, when they buy routers, they just want to buy the one with the highest number, sort of. So, um, yeah, that's that. 
Um, so how um, does this uh, Wi-Fi chip uh, look uh, on the inside like uh, when we look at a, a block diagram? So um, from the right-hand side to the left-hand side, we have a few components. So we first start with the antenna, and then we have the, the radio, which is really the hardware, which is turning um, the, the, the wireless signals into bits. And then we have the, the physical layer, which uh, turns the, the bits into actual data, which we can process. And then we um, uh, have a, a real-time core in this case, which does all the time-critical uh, calculations. And then we have what I call just a Wi-Fi core here. This could be a, a, an ARM processor or, or anything else. Um, and then in this case, I said, okay, we have a, a PCIe core, which does the connection to the, to the rest of the notebook, basically. And uh, all of these cores are connected via some, some interconnect. For, for ARM, it could be some uh, uh, AMBAS standard, like uh, AXI or APB, but um, there, there are different technologies. Um, it's also important to mention that this real-time core, there are different um, uh, types of Wi-Fi chips. So I decided to, so for Broadcom, which I will explain later on a bit deeper, they use such a real-time core to, to do this, this, um, this, these fast calculations. So this is a separate core, really. But there are other um, designs which, for example, have just have an, a, a second core from an arm just dedicated for this real-time stuff. And then uh, more cores are used for um, the Mac layer. So, um, and um, overall, this is a, a full Mac chip. So this means that um, the the Mac layer of Wi-Fi is uh, calculated within the Wi-Fi chip itself. So um, in comparison to, that, to this, there are also soft Mac chips. Uh, and in the soft Mac chips, the um, calculation of the Mac layer is done on the host, basically on the notebook itself, on the driver. But um, the majority of uh, chips, in my opinion, are full Mac chips. So at least in smartphones and integrated stuff which you have in your notebook is usually a full Mac chip. So, and then in this talk, I will go uh, deeper into those four uh, blocks. So we start with uh, the radio and um, the antenna, and then we will go into how does the physical layer work, uh, what's need to be done in, in the real-time core, and uh, we briefly discuss what's happening in the Mac layer. So let's first discuss the, uh, the antenna. And for this, we need to introduce the concepts of uh, wavelength. So, um, Basically, I, what, I, what I wanted to, to get to is how do we even know how long does an antenna need to be? And um, usually we, uh, in like older routers, we just have these sort of uh, like a monopole um, like uh, type antennas, which are just some kind of uh, metal rod basically. And um, what we could do is we can use this frequency here to uh, calculate the, the length of this uh, by calculating the uh, wavelength which we want to receive, basically. And um, the wavelengths can be cal calculated by uh, taking the, um, the time, for the, the, light sp uh, the speed of light, basically, dividing by the, the frequency which we want to receive. In this case, so at Wi-Fi 2.4 gigahertz and Wi-Fi at channel 6, we uh, can calculate, okay, this is uh, roughly 12 centimeters. And now we also need to know that um, the antenna is usually half or a quarter of the wavelength. And then we, we, it, is, it makes sense, right? So like uh, six centimeters is around this. And this, if, if you have like an older Wi-Fi router, something like this, this is roughly six centimeters, so it makes sense. And even for um, integrated um, uh, Wi-Fi chips in the notebook, these are usually, um, they're sometimes using uh, PCB antennas, but it's the same concept. So they, they uh, could use uh, maybe the, the just a quarter of the wavelength. It would be three centimeters then. This could be easily done on a PCB. And uh, one more thing which is important to uh, mention is the antenna orientation is also important. So as you can see here in this diagram, this is basically like in, in, inside of this donut, there is this monopole antenna which sticks out like this. And you can see the, 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 the power is mainly going horizontally so, uh, and not vertically. So it's important to, to basically uh, have sender and receiver on the same orientation for the best um, uh, reception. 
Okay, so now that we know uh, about uh, a little bit about the antenna, uh, how do we even, um, how does these signals even look like? So um, I um, just wanted to give a, a, a rough uh, idea or, or provide a rough idea here. And uh, so here I have an, uh, a cosine basically function with, uh, which has some kind of amplitude and which changes like this uh, over time. And um, what I can do is, so in general, you can look at this uh, sort of signal in, in two ways. You can look at it, it from, a, from a time domain, and you can look at it in a, from a frequency domain. And um, if you have a perfect cosine, then uh, in, uh, in the time domain, you would have uh, just a single point of a frequency uh, in the frequency domain. So as, as you can see here, this, the x-axis is uh, uh, here frequency instead of time. And um, basically what this, uh, this uh, shows is that on, uh, just a, in a, that this signal just consists of a single frequency. In reality, Wi-Fi consists of many frequencies. I mean, it, it, it would look uh, more like a, like a bell shaped or something like this, because like you have all these different frequencies which your complete sig or like your complete um, yeah, signal consists of. But this is just for, for simplification. And it's also important to mention that we can use the fast Fourier transformation to get from the time domain to the frequency domain, and uh, the inverse of that, so the inverse fast Fourier transformation back from the uh, frequency domain to the time domain. And uh, if we use the correct parameters, we can do this lossless. So either way, each direction we go, it's not a problem. Um, we can do the transformation lossless usually, so without using any information. So um, what ways are there to encode data in such signals? So how can I manipulate them to, to show a difference between zero and one, right? So, um, and there are mainly three ways to do this. So um, one could uh, say I just uh, change the frequency by sort of changing the width of this cosine I, I showed earlier. I can uh, also change the amplitude of this cosine. And what is a bit sort of counterintuitive is like I can change the phase. So um, as we saw before, this, uh, this cosine changes over time. So it has a sort of a cycle. And depending on when I start this cycle, I, uh, by, for example, here I, I just flip it basically. And instead of uh, sending uh, at this point in time here in the middle line, in just, uh, instead of just sending it the same signal uh, again, I can basically flip the, the, the orientation of this and, um, and send it again. And, and this is called like uh, changing the phase. And uh, for Wi-Fi, we mainly look into those two. So the amplitude and the phase change. Um, so one more slide to, to make this a bit more, um, um, uh, to, to show this a bit more. So here in this first uh, example, I uh, used phase modulation to to encode a zero, and uh, then I, uh, as before, I flipped it basically to encode a one, and then I went back, flipped it again to encode a zero, and then again a zero, nothing changed. So um, this, this is basically the, the, the phase modulation, and for the amplitude modulation, what I did here is just I, I used the, um, uh, I, I do not send anything when I send, want to send a zero, and when I send, uh, want to send a one, I just uh, send with, uh, uh, some kind of frequency. I can also like just do a, a lower amplitude and a higher amplitude to, to make the difference between a zero and a one. Um, so this is just an example. Okay, the, the next important concept which we need to understand is the, the um, IQ constellation diagram. And I already told you we need to, for Wi-Fi, we need both the uh, amplitude and the phase of the signal. And uh, in an IQ diagram, unfortunately, what we cannot do is just say, um, like one axis is the amplitude and the other axis is the phase. Th this is not how it works. We just need to, like there is a lot of math which we can look into, but uh, for now we can just say, okay, an amplitude and a phase somehow describes a point in this IQ diagram. And I can get to this point by uh, using the amplitude um, as the length of this vector here. And they can use the phase to, uh, to sort of uh, from, uh, from the positive axis here to go counterclockwise to say, okay, how, how far does this, or, um, or how, how far do I need to, to get with this vector? And then if I have these two information, two pieces of information, I can basically create this cross 
inside this IQ diagram. And this will be, will be very important, as we uh, will see briefly. So with this uh, in mind already, I, I can try to encode data. So um, here, for example, I just said, OK, uh, at the left-hand uh, upper corner uh, here is 0, 0, then the, the right-hand side is 0, 1, and then uh, and same for, for the bottom. So I can already encode like two bits with uh, one cross, sort of. And uh, this is already a modulation scheme. So here, this is called uh, QPSK because um, I only use the phase here in this example. I don't change the, the, the amplitude. So if you can see, maybe uh, you can maybe hopefully see it. So this is all uh, the, the, the length of this vector should always be the same. So what you can also do, you can even uh, use more crosses in this diagram to encode more bits at the same time. But then you need to also modify the amplitude. Okay, so maybe you have seen a, a, a diagram like this um, in, uh, at some point in time. So um, I want to, to explain how OFDM works. OFDM stands for uh, orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. And um, this is very important because we, we want to send not only um, when we, do we want to use the, the amplitude of, of, and the phase of a single frequency? We want to change the amplitude of, of, in the phase of many frequencies at the same time. And um, the frequency should be as close as possible. But um, now you may think, OK, but usually at Wi-Fi, at 2.4 gigahertz, I can only use like uh, three channels. Uh, so there are uh, 11 channels in total. But everybody says I can just use channel 1, channel uh, 6, and channel 11 usually. And I should not overlap them. So how does this work? That, that I, Now I'm saying that um, I, 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 we want to use many frequencies at the same time. And this is the, the trick of, of OFDM and how this actually works is that um, we use what they call subcarriers. And the subcarrier is a different frequency. And um, so basically, what you can see here, these, all these different uh, frequencies, this, uh, this is what you, for example, can see in your router. So sometimes your router tells you which um, neighboring access points there are and which channel is best for you to choose for your access point. And it could look like this, that you have like some neighbors which are sent on, on channel 1 and, and 6 and 11, and you can try to figure out which one is, uh, is the, has the, the lowest um, reception for, uh, to, to set the uh, channel appropriately for your router. But um, what, what I want to tell is basically one of these envelopes here is consists of many frequencies actually it's not a single frequency it's many frequencies and um, they don't call them frequencies they call them subcarriers and uh, we want to to space them as close as possible and um, in a case of uh, 802.11a we have uh, 52 subcarriers in total 48 of them are uh, used for data and four are used for pilot signals and this is used for synchronization but um, how can we actually um, basically get those frequencies so close to each other. And uh, the trick is, we, um, when one frequency is, is at, ex at its peak power, we try to um, map the, the next frequency so that basically it's close to zero. And because we are on the, the uh, on, um, this is basically one device only, we can do this, this, this spacing very carefully, and therefore uh, they do not interfere with each other. And we can still basically use um, amplitude and phase modulation for each of these frequencies. And that's how we get to these huge data rates in Wi-Fi. So we, we have many frequencies, and for each of these frequencies, we change the amplitude and the phase. So I hope this makes sense. Um, so this, this was the, the frequency domain, as I explained earlier. And uh, in reality, like um, if we do the IFFT, in the time domain, it would uh, look like this. So it's like a very um, strange um, um, sort of signal, because it's all um, summed up and, and mixed together. And that's why, why it looks like this. But with this carefully spacing of these frequencies, we can still figure out on the receiver side how the amplitude and the phase for each of these frequencies look like. OK, with all this in mind, we can already um, 
uh, try to calculate how does, for example, one come to uh, 55 megabit per second. So in uh, older Wi-Fi standards, the, the routers uh, always promised us to, to have uh, 55 megabits per second. So how, how was this e even calculated? So this was like never achieved in reality. You have like, more like 20 megabits or so. And, uh, but still, this is basically the, the, what, what they, um, they advertise their routers with. And the rate, data rate is calculated by, um, by this formula. And all we do is basically use the, the bits per symbol. So basically, how many bits is one cross uh, in this IQ diagram? And then the number of subcarriers, so the number of frequencies. And we divide that by the, the, the duration it takes for one of these crosses to be transmitted. So um, in a previous example, I had like one cross was, was um, two bits. But here in this case, we have uh, like uh, 64 QAM, which means I have 64 different crosses which I can use to encode bits. This means one cross can have uh, six bits uh, worth of information. And if I used uh, this to and multiply it by uh, the number of subcarriers, so I just told you it's uh, 48 for um, this Wi-Fi standard, uh, and we divide it by the time it takes to, to send this, so this is four microseconds. In this case, we get to, to 72 megabits. And now we, we also need to um, take care of the encoding. Encoding in this key case means um, forward error correction. So in this case, I need to investigate four bits to send three. So this means I, I need to one fourth of, uh, of this, uh, what we just calculated, I need to throw away, basically. And this is how, how you get to 54 megabits per second. OK. So now we can uh, have a deeper look into uh, how these splitting blocks I mentioned earlier actually work. So um, at the first step, this is the, the radio. And it consists of mainly these uh, of like four major um, components. So um, after the antenna, we usually have an amplifier. And uh, this amplifier just uh, brings up the, the amplitude of the signal so that we can easier, have an easier time to, um, to, um, to read it and decode it. And then we actually split up the, the signal into two parallel paths. So one is for I and one is for Q. And at the end of this, we have uh, what we need to, to make our crosses in this IQ diagram and to get back from the cross to the actual bits. And that's why this uh, IQ constellation diagram is so important, because every, everything comes back to, to IQ, basically. And to get, the, um, to, to, to get the separation for I and Q, uh, and the next step, we have this mixer. And this mixer usually uh, does a down conversion from uh, 2.4 gigahertz to uh, something close to zero, because um, if we are close to zero, uh, our uh, analog to digital converters can be very cheap. And uh, we can also, at the same time, uh, when we do this mixing, we can also do the split up between the, the I and Q um, sort of um, part of the signal. Um, then the next phase would be a filter usually. So in this case, a bandpass filter just gets rid of anything which uh, we don't want in our signal. And then the, the last step is this analog to digital converter, which uh, does uh, actually a sampling. So somehow we need a way to uh, get from our analog signal to a digital res representation. And this is done by, um, by sampling. And uh, sampling means we uh, have a certain period in time where we look at the, the, um, the waveform and we note down the value for, for this. Uh, um, and, and, and this is how we, we try to roughly get uh, to the, the values which are um, uh, actually used in the analog waveform. And um, so the question is, how often do I basically need to, to do the sampling? And for this, there is the, the Nyquist theorem. And this says I need at least twice the bandwidth, um, uh, twice the band my sample rate needs to be twice the bandwidth. So in this case, usually in Wi-Fi, you have like uh, 20 mega, uh, or like in, in all the Wi-Fi standards, you have like um, uh, 20 megahertz wide signal. And then because we split it up, uh, we only have like uh, one, 10 megahertz on, on each side here. And this means we need at least uh, a 20 megahertz uh, sampling rate for uh, in each ADC here. Okay, 
So um, this is all well and good in theory, but um, is this also the reality? And uh, here in the next slide, I brought um, um, a sort of scary looking uh, data sheet from a uh, software defined radio from analog devices. But um, if we sort of try to blend out all the unimportant stuff, we can see that actually, yes, this is uh, how, how it works in reality. So at the beginning, we have our um, low noise amplifier, which is just uh, brings up the, the signal I mentioned earlier. And then there are these two paths again for, for I and Q. And um, it, it, then there is the, the mixer, which brings down the, the signal from 2.4 gigahertz to zero, uh, to zero megahertz. And then we have uh, some uh, low, um, some some bandpass filtering or some some kind of filtering, and then we do our uh, analog to digital conversion. And then there are, admittedly, there are like additional steps here, but this is because it's a software-defined radio. A software-defined radio is usually has the advantage that it's not only receiving a, an, on a single frequency, but it has a, like a wide range of frequencies which, which you can receive and probably also send, and that's why we need this additional stuff. But in general, the rough um, components I showed you earlier, this is also how it works in, in the reality. And another example I have is here from, from, from a Broadcom chip. So um, this is from uh, um, uh, so the Broadcom was first sold to, to Cypress and now it's owned by Infineon. Uh, by Infineon. And it's uh, now the, 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 the names of the chips have uh, changed in the past, but this is like a 4339 uh, original Broadcom chip. And um, in this case, um, they have um, uh, it, it looks similar to what we just discussed. So we have like uh, low noise amplifiers at the beginning. We have uh, a mixer. We have the the, um, the filtering and the analog to digital conversion. They they just don't show you the both IQ uh, path. They just assume that you know. Okay, from this point on, it's basically a two parallel path. And uh, the the path which is shown below here, this is a dedicated path for five gigahertz. So here the the the. The top path is basically used or shared between Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, and then the, the below path is only for uh, five gigahertz Wi-Fi. Okay, so, so much for, for the radio. Um, and um, as I said, at the end of this, we have IQ signals, but we still don't have like, these are already bits, but we, we, we don't have like the actual knowledge what they, these bits mean. And this is what's, what's going to happen in, in the next stage. This is what's going to, to be decoded in the physical layer. So the steps in the physical layer are usually those five uh, building blocks. So, um, and they are the same for receiving and, and sending, of course. It's just that the direction is, or like the order of which in which stuff is done is different. So for, um, and I, I will uh, talk about the receiving path here only. So for receiving, the first thing we need to do is we need to have this sort of a frame detection and synchronization. So where does our frame even start? Uh, after this, we need to get from the um, time representation to a frequency rep representation. After this, we have uh, a demapper, which basically uh, looks up the where is this cross in our IQ diagram and which kind of bit is this. And then we do um, which I call decoding here, which is basically the forward error correction. And then we, we need to uh, descramble it. Um, so these are the, the, the basic blocks, and now we, we go into, uh, um, we, we, we will explore them in greater detail in the upcoming slides. Um, but first, we need to uh, introduce an, an additional concept, which are called uh, multipath effects. So this is uh, important for the frame detection and synchronization. So if you imagine you have a, a sender and a receiver, uh, the signal could maybe propagate uh, straight from the sender to the receiver, but let's say there is like a wall in, in, in uh, just in close proximity here, then this signal can actually bounce from this wall and um, get received by the, 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 um, the receiver a second time. And this is a problem which we need to solve, and this is called basically multipath effects because you, you receive the, the signal more or less twice, but like uh, sort of on uh, different points in time and slightly different points in time. And this is what I, what I tried to, to, um, to um, show here. So basically the first line is, would be like the direct line and the second line would be the indirect line um, bouncing off from the wall. And um, what we do against this um, 
this uh, this interferences, we we you, uh, basically we duplicate some um, piece of information in the signal. So um, here we uh, this is called the, the guard interval, and this is basically copied from the end of the symbol into the front, and this is also called a cyclic prefix. And then so basically this all of this here is one symbol, and then here there would be the the, the next one. And uh, the problem comes up when I try to, so here I'm, I'm basically at this point in time I'm already done with receiving the, the first symbol and I want to receive the second symbol, but uh, now I, I have this sort of overlap still from, from the sim, uh, first symbol and I, I don't know what it's like. Um, is this like, uh, the, does this piece of information come from, from symbol two or symbol one? And this is where I have the actual problem. So. Um, you, you may also think, okay, but isn't it also a problem that uh, symbol one is received twice here? Is this not also some kind of interference? And you would be right. Um, but we can, it, it's basically because this is the same um, information, it's not that bad. It's, it's just bad because like this is uh, actual, two, it could be two different pieces of information and I need to sort of distinguish them. And um, what I can do is, Okay, um, now that I want to actually receive symbol two without receiving symbol one, I just discard this whole block here, and then uh, but I still have uh, all of the information from symbol two because I um, now I, I, I have the same situation as the beginning. I just have uh, all of symbol two, and then here it's also symbol two. So this is how I can basically try to figure out what is uh, which um, symbol in. Um, without uh, having too much interference between symbols. Okay, um, apart from that, we also have a so-called preamble at the beginning of a, a symbol. So this preamble uh, consists of a short training field and a long training field. And uh, what is called uh, the, the actual symbol, um, um, yeah, piece of, um, data here, oh, and um, it, the, the, what the symbol does is it just encodes the modulation and, and the coding scheme for the actual data. So, so this means um, basically the whole um, piece at the front of uh, before the data is always encoded in the same data rate. So you maybe know that um, depending on the uh, reception of your signal and how good or, or bad uh, your reception is, the data rate changes, right? So um, you could have a very good reception with a high data rate, and, and this is how it's actually done. So um, you basically uh, encode how, um, you figure out how good the channel is, and then you encode the, the data rate of the um, the, the modulation scheme and, and, and so on in, in this symbol field. And then you can, you know, okay, for upcoming data, uh, I need to use the, this and that uh, encoding scheme. And uh, yeah, and this also means that this part in the front of here, this is always encoded the same. So this does not change. And then, um, so what does this short training field and long training field actually do? So this is um, basically the, the sender is using um, known magnitudes, uh, so basically amplitudes and phases, and uh, basically encodes uh, data with this. And then the, the receiver can, um, can check this and can say, okay, I know it should look like this, but it actually looks like this. And then I can try to uh, use the, the difference between this, these two informations to um, add this uh, as a sort of correction data to the rest of it. And this is called equalization. And this is what we need to do because um, for example, here we had these two symbols at the same time sent, uh, and with this equalization, we can figure out what the, the, the difference or like which kind of interferences we have, and we can use this um, these pieces of information to correct the data which is sent afterwards. So from a, from an IQ perspective, this looks like this. So maybe the the receiver has like um, some kinds of symbols which are all, all over the place but he, he needs to, to know exactly where they are, and he can basically use the equalization data to, to say, okay, uh, and, uh, these um, crosses actually need to be here or, or here, and then um, do the, the decoding afterwards and correct is the errors which, are, which happened during, uh, during um, transmission. Okay, so after uh, frame detection and synchronization, we can do uh, the next step. So here at the bottom right, I always try to, to show where we currently are. So next step is the uh, fast Fourier transformation. So as I said at the beginning, um, 
we we can basically go back and forth from time uh, to frequency um, and this is what is done here so for sending i always need to be at the time free, uh, domain but for decoding i want to uh, go to the frequency domain and here in this case i i just uh, have basically different frequencies and they all have the same um, amplitude but they could have different amplitudes and then uh, I can use this basically uh, to uh, create my crosses in this IQ diagram and then I can depending on where the cross is I can go back to my bits and this is uh, the basically called demapping okay so um, what is uh, what, what happens in, in case of errors so let's say um, uh, I have an like even simpler example instead of like uh, having four crosses I only have like two crosses left hand side is a zero right hand side is a one and uh, but still maybe I, I have like a really bad channel and um, it turns out that um, one cross which is supposed to be a zero moves uh, like uh, over over the, this, this sort of barrier and it is now uh, interpreted as a one so can I somehow um, still decode this or, or figure out that that uh, has something gone wrong and um, so what we could think of as an example is okay let's say I have four bits and uh, the fifth one would be a parity bit doesn't matter how it's calculated but we know when this is sent and we receive this and the and we calculate the parity uh, from these four bits we have received we know that the parity is bad okay somewhere needs to be an error but how do we even know where the error is okay I just highlighted it here but the, we, we need to so, so, sort of a, sort of an automated fashion to um, to figure out uh, which of the bits is bad basically because we send we can send multiple bits at the same time because one cross is worth multiple bits and um, what's actually being done is instead of just saying okay like uh, this um, um, I, I just do a binary sort of decision in this case is this a, is this a one or a zero I, I can uh, basically try to provide uh, probabilities um, to these so here in this case this one I was pretty sure that this is a one so it was like a 0 0.98 uh, for this zero I'm pretty sure it's a zero because like the actual value was like 0 0.02 but for this one this was just like barely over the line it was just 0.52 uh, so this is sort of suspicious and the next one is still like pretty good so if I have an, a parity error and I have like um, this additional information of like how like um, good this um, mm, the, 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 this demapping was then, then I can say okay if I only have like one uh, suspicious bit in here I, uh, it's most likely that the, the error uh, was in, uh, uh, here and then I can just basically flip the bit and um, the parity should be good again and, and this is called a soft demapping because like you don't do this hard decision between a zero and a one you have additional information based on these probabilities or sort of probabilities and uh, for this uh, uh, um, uh, uh, an algorithm which is called uh, Viterbi is often used um, but this is all it does basically okay the last step which we need to look at is descrambling um, the sender needs to uh, scramble the data to avoid even numbers of zeros and ones um, we want to avoid this because we want to uh, spread the power across the spectrum um, evenly if possible so we, we don't want to like just have one point where um, uh, we have like lots of ones and like lots of power so this this could cause interference and how this is done is uh, there's like um, something which is called hardware a linear feedback shift register and then you have like a polynomial which you can apply and this is like not a cryptographic uh, uh, randomization it's just like um, um, trying to even out the zeros and ones that's all it does and we, we, we basically know the algorithm which is used and the, the pol polynomial uh, which the, the sender is used also in the receiver and it's just straightforward to reverse this effect basically okay but now we have looked into all the steps which are necessary and now the question again is is this also the case in reality and I uh, um, back to our data sheet from the Broadcom chip we can see um, maybe it's a little small but like the 
The first step, the frequency and time synchronization, is uh, also part of this um, physical layer block here. Then we have um, a block which can uh, be used for fast Fourier transformation. We have uh, demodulation and uh, the Viterbi, so basically the demapper, and uh, the Viterbi um, decoder, which does the forward error correction. And, um, and then we, we need to descramble it. But in the end, we, we have uh, bits which are ready for uh, the Mac layer or the, the real-time core. OK, speaking of real-time core, let's um, see what this is all about. Um, so first, uh, before we, we, so the real-time core, as I said, it, it, it takes care of everything which, which um, leads to uh, happen quick, right? So. Um, and there is a problem, a specific problem which it tries to solve here is um, if multiple parties, like the, 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 the example I showed at the very beginning with the Aloha net, if they, they um, can they, they actually send at the same time? And the uh, answer is obviously no, because we have like a shared medium. And in contrast to Ethernet, what we can do in Ethernet is to first listen at the same time and then send if there's nothing going on. But in Wi-Fi, we, we cannot listen and send at the same time. So we need some kind of algorithm to, to fix this. And this, this algorithm, it needs to happen so fast that we like, need to separate real-time handling of it. That, that, that's the, the main purpose of this, this real-time core. So, so to make this more, um, to, to show this a bit more, so this problem is called the hidden terminal problem. So let's go back to this um, Aloha net thing, which I explained at the beginning. So let's say I have like two islands, uh, island A and island C, and island A is only uh, like so, uh, like the, the reception of island A is only so far, um, um, so it does not, uh, it's not received by island C and other way around. So um, C doesn't see A and other way around. But in the middle, I have, for example, my mainframe. And uh, both of them um, see the mainframe, but they, they don't see each other. And that's, that's the hidden terminal, basically. For A, it can see B, but no C. And C can, uh, and it's the same for B, right? So it cannot see A. And that's the hidden terminal problem. And that's why we can have these collisions. So how we can get rid of this? And um, what people came up with is called the distributed coordination function. DCF, and uh, what's being done is basically, so here going back to this, uh, this diagram, so I have a sender, let's say A, and the receiver, let's say B. So a source and destination here. And um, before I do anything, I uh, just wait a bit. So this is called the, the DCF in the framing space. So this is just a, a brief period of time. Every time I send something, I, the first thing I do is waiting. Then. Um, if this, if, this, if this period is over, I send a ready to send uh, packet to the destination. The destination also uh, waits for a brief uh, period of time and then says, okay, I think nothing is going on. Uh, everything is clear. So it's the, it sends the clear to send back to the source. And then after another brief period of time, the, uh, the source can actually send data to the destination. And the, at the end, the, the destination does acknowledge that it got the data and send the acknowledgement back. And then, only then, basically another um, source can send to the destination. And because the destination does basically sort of um, repeat this RTS sent by the source to everybody around it, so we can imagine that there is not only like island A, island B, but there's also island C, then uh, basically island C can see, okay, there is something going on between A and B, I need to shut up. And, and that's, that's how, how this is solved, basically. Um, so this, this is also what I tried to, to write down here. So this, this waiting, so what also can be done is, the let's say island C is the others here, it can, after the first uh, ready to send was received, it can um, send an internal timer um, because like all these 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 times are, are pretty um, deterministic, right? So it, it knows, okay, and, and there is also even encoded how much data they want to send. So they can uh, send the internal timer and they, they know exactly like um, how long it still takes till, till I'm allowed to send. And for example, this, can, this information can be used for power saving. So they can power down during this, this uh, uh, period of time. And then only um, after this, this next DF, DIFS, they, they can start sending again. 
And to avoid that everybody is screaming at the same time again, there is also a random backoff added. And I can also update this time when I uh, somehow receive the, the, the only the, the clear to send. And uh, you might, might ask, okay, there's uh, these two different types of, of waiting, like there's this DIFS and SIFS, and the reason for this is basically to have an implicit priori prioritization. So they always wanted to make sure that these control packets, the RTS, the CTS, and the acknowledgement, is always sent before the actual um, someone tries to send data again. And this way, um, uh, because the, the SIFS is uh, way shorter than the DIFS, so SIFS is like uh, 10 to 16 microseconds, and um, uh, DIFS is uh, like 34 microseconds. And so, like, uh, they, they try to have this, to use this as an impl implicit prioritization. And uh, why even is there an, uh, why do I even need uh, this SIFS at the, the destination? This is mostly to, to uh, give the, the transceiver some time to switch between sending and receiving. Okay, then the, um, let me speed up a bit. So the, the last part here is mainly the, the Mac layer. So um, um, the, actually this is the major part of the, um, the where the, the firmware code is at. So the, the real-time core can just be like a simple state machine, but uh, the, there's much complexity in the Mac layer. And um, because like at the end of this, this whole transmission thing, all you get at the end here is just um, Ethernet packets. So as, as, uh, um, as, as was said during my introduction, uh, the Wi-Fi chip, chip does all the abstraction for you, and at the end you all only get uh, Ethernet packets. And therefore there needs to be like a lot of pre-processing which is done in the Mac layer. So what does this Mac layer um, do? It, it does uh, frame aggregation and, and fragmentation. So let's say you have a very good channel, you can put more frames together and send them at once, and also acknowledge them at once. If you have a very bad uh, channel, you can try to split them up, send them individually. Um, you need to do actual scanning, so where, uh, what uh, access points are there even around me? Then if you have found one, you need to do uh, some security and uh, association to this um, access point. Then there is power saving done in here. And there's roaming, so let's say you want to switch between two different uh, access points. This needs to be handled so that you don't um, lose connection in between. And there is also some checksums being done. So these, um, which kind of uh, frames are handled during um, in the Mac layer? So we already saw that there is, um, when I explained the, the distributed coordination function, there are data frames and then there are these control frames. So the, um, the acknowledgement and the ready for send and clear to send. And what you see, and then there is also beacons, which are called, for example, beacons. There are other types of management frames, but um, um, yeah, so one, one, uh, the most um, relevant uh, type of management frame is, is a beacon, which just is sent by the access point to, to say, hey, hey, here I am, I'm on uh, channel so-and-so, and my name is so-and-so. So, but for the, um, for the uh, actual uh, data, which, uh, um, or for the, for the things you see in the Linux uh, driver, this is just basically the data frames. But but maybe you say okay there's but there still needs to be a way to to um, to send control messages to the um, to the driver because I want to st uh, have it starting uh, starting scanning and getting results back and that's exactly right so there is two different paths of um, how um, uh, data is moved between the application or like um, the user space and the actual firmware so one is used for data and the other one is for control frames. Uh, or for, for not control frames, it's, it's not, there are, there are no frames exchanged. It's just a sort of an interface which is defined by uh, CFG 802.11 in this case, uh, which just says, okay, from, from experience we know that uh, these um, um, functions uh, a driver needs to provide, so, um, and then the proprietary driver can implement these functions and they can be used by the, by the uh, upper layer um, software. So, but still, this is basically the, the sort of the control or management interface, and this is the actual data which is being exchanged. Okay, but um, maybe we we um, we want to to get uh, an open source firmware, 
And um, so as I said, um, this is all very um, proprietary. So for example, the, both the software running for um, the Wi-Fi core as well as the real-time core uh, in the Broadcom case, this is just a binary blob. And um, maybe we, we want to, to uh, reverse engineer this and uh, have a sort of open source uh, firmware. So what, which steps do we, we, we need to, to um, take care of here? And I think this was uh, even part of a, a previous talk. Um, so there was someone, uh, Jasper, I believe, who talked about um, reverse engineering the ESP Wi-Fi firmware. And uh, I, I figured these uh, are all the steps which would be necessary in general to reverse engineer uh, a Wi-Fi firmware and to create uh, your own. So the first step would be we need to figure out how is the hardware initialized, so which registers are, um, are written to at the beginning to set up the, firm, the hardware. Then we also need some primitives to, uh, maybe you can just reuse some function at the beginning to send and receive packets. We need to figure out how can I run data in sort of tasks or processes because I don't want to congest the main loop all the time. Um, what is, um, how is the real-time part, like this uh, distributed coordination function I explained earlier, how is this handled? Uh, is this like a more like I said, is this like a, a separate core or how is, how is this working? And then um, we also maybe want to do some packet filtering. So we don't want to receive everybody's frames, but just the ones which are um, intended by us, intended to be received by us. And in the end, we, we need to, um, if we want to make this upstream for the Linux kernel, we need to find a way to um, get this GPL license. And the only way there is basically is that the one who does the reverse engineering need to um, create a documentation. And this documentation need to be so good that someone else can implement a working firmware from this uh, um, uh, documentation. This is called like a clean room implementation. And this is the only way you can do a GPL licensing. But this is maybe another topic. OK, I think I have a few more minutes. I just want to um, show um, a brief demo, because like, I always ask myself, how does this IQ diagram look in, in reality? And how bad is it really to, to figure out where this cross is exactly and which bits are encoded by this? So what I, what I have done is I have basically an old smartphone, which I was able to, to modify using um, a framework which is called Nexmon which you can use to modify the firmware in, in, uh, used by this uh, Wi-Fi chip in this um, smartphone. And I just um, did a simple patch where I, uh, I, I just sent out small data packets all the time. And then on the other side, on the receiving side, I have a, 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 a FPGA board and an um, SDR chip, which is running uh, Open Wi-Fi. Open Wi-Fi is a complete implementation of Wi-Fi, everything, the Mac layer, um, everything and uh, down to to the real time core, and um, you can change everything with Open Wi Fi. Open Wi Fi is great, and I have a, a notebook basically connected to this. And we can what we can do with this setup is seeing basically this equalization data I mentioned earlier. This is sent at the preamble, and if we take um, this this correction data, we can basically plot the the, the crosses and see how they they look like. And um, so this is uh, show. This I can show in a brief video. So what I, I did before we, we even start the video is I already started the sender so that the, the smartphone does already start sending packets. And here we can see, um, I will just start the monitor mode to show you the packets really quick. And um, you can see that they are sent at a data rate of uh, 24 megabits per second. You can see that at the bottom left, maybe. And this data rate means we need um, 16 crosses, basically, to, to encode the, 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 the bits. Um, so after sending, after starting the sender, I can also start the, the receiver, the FPGA board. And then we get this nice um, sort of view. So just focus on the right-hand side. This is the actual. Uh, constellation diagram, and this is me holding the smartphone. And as you can see, depending on how I hold the smartphone and just slightly change it, the, the points uh, on the on the on the right hand side are already pretty disturbing. On it. it's like it's very difficult to 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 figure out like what is like which of these points is supposed to to be in in which sort of sector, and. Um, yeah, this is just to, to give you a rough idea of how this actually looks like and how difficult it is for the, the Wi-Fi hardware to actually receive your data. 
Okay, that's all from my side. Yeah, thanks. I hope we have a few minutes for discussion. Okay, wow. That was a lot of information. Thanks for the great talk. And we have time for a few short questions. So raise your hand. Um, thank you for the great talk. Uh, can you talk a little bit about different generations of Wi-Fi and what has improved in the processes that you talked about? So, yeah, things only got more complex. Um, um, so when I... When I started back at this next one project I mentioned, which I used to send the frames uh, with this smartphone, right? I started with uh, an 802.11b uh, Wi-Fi chip, so a pretty old one. And um, the amount of uh, firmware which is needed to, to do all the, the Mac layer stuff, it just got more and more complex. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I think this is the only uh, adjective I, I can uh, imagine. Uh, so that the hardware gets more complex. The, the, like the register interface, it gets more complex. If you want to do any reverse engineering, I, I just, um, I feel like it's easiest to start with a very old chip, try to get from there, and usually software is reused over the time, and then if you figure out how the old stuff is done, you know already parts of the newer stuff, and then you go from there, basically. I hope this answers the question. Other questions? Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, is there any good um, Wi-Fi chip with an open source firmware that you can recommend? Some so there is no open source, completely open source firmware, there is none. So there is no proprietary chip which has uh, a completely open source firmware. I think the, uh, Jasper with his ESP project is the first one to actually achieve this. Um, <laughs> uh, and, um, but apart from this, there is this next one framework where, where we try to um, provide a framework where you can um, reuse parts of the existing firmware to implement your own stuff. So this is there for uh, Broadcom, and I also tried to wrote, write something similar for um, Extensa-based Qualcomm chips. But apart from that, there is no complete open source firmware. So the, the closest thing you can use is really the this. Uh, um, this uh, open Wi-Fi um, thing, but for this you always need uh, a complete FPGA to do all the read time stuff, and then you need a really expensive um, SDR like this AD9361 uh, to get the IQ symbols, basically. Then everything, so for open Wi-Fi, the whole FPGA implementation, everything is open source. But this is the only thing I'm aware of, and the ESP um, efforts by Jasper. So about open source firmware for uh, Wi-Fi chips, I thought that the Atheros, Qualcomm, uh, I think before Qualcomm, old chips, ATH 9K were like that? That's true, yeah. That's a, a really old soft Mac chip. So this means that the Mac layer was handled on the, the notebook, basically, and not on the chip. And therefore, it was easy to modify the Mac layer. But I have never looked into this, but I would assume that stuff like the distributed coordination function is still handled either in hardware or in like a small uh, firmware blob inside the chip. But you're right, at least the Mac layer back for those chips was sort of open source because they did this, they offloaded it to, 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 the, hard, uh, to the notebook and did not handle it on the chip itself, if that makes sense. Oh, there's one more. There's one more question over there. Uh, in the communication between the chip and the PC, um, is there some special protocol for this, or is it different for every chip? It's different for every uh, vendor, I would say. So, um, and even for um, maybe different generations of chips, it could be different. So. Um, I recently looked into MediaTek. They um, they are completely different than Broadcom. So it's it's basically always um, this this control channel um, I mentioned back here between the driver and the firmware. This is always very different. The, the this interface, of course, this is like uh, standardized because of this CFG 811. This comes from the this is defined by the Linux kernel. But down here, this is completely proprietary, and in some cases they they. Um, have some um, 
uh, even like the, the physical interface is different. So you can use um, SDIO, for example, to communicate with the the the, um, the Wi-Fi chip, so which is called, sort of like an interface uh, used for uh, MMC cards. Uh, there's PCIe I mentioned earlier, and then on, on top of this, that there's also different implementations which are, are possible. So it's very different for for, for different vendors. Thank you for this intense uh, lecture in the early morning. Um, did you find any of the hardware gadgets which uh, have been handed out at CCC events useful for your analysis? Sorry, say again, which hardware gadget? Oh, like... Um, Rocket and stuff. Uh, um, I did not use any of those, um, but uh, any SDR would be helpful, definitely. Um, but it's like the, 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 the major work is always reverse engineering the, the firmware itself and, and understanding the firmware. And um, it's like if you get so far that you can actually sense something, then an SDR gets really handy. But uh, first of all, you need to understand the firmware um, and, then, and then you can continue. Yeah. Okay. Thanks again to Daniel. And uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>